Today's scripture comes from Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. Some who were present on that occasion told Jesus about the Galileans whom Pilate had killed while they were offering sacrifices. He explained, Do you think the suffering of these Galileans proves that they were sinful more than the other Galileans? No. I tell you, but unless you change your hearts and lives, you will die just as they did. What about the 18 people who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think they were more guilty of wrongdoing than everyone else that lives in Jerusalem? No, he answered. I tell you, but unless you change your hearts and lives, you will die just as they did. Jesus told this parable. A man owned a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. He said to his gardener, look, I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree for the last past three years, and I've never found any on it. Cut it down. Why should it continue depleting the soil's nutrients? The gardener responded. He said, Lord, give it one more year. I will dig around it and give it fertilizer. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is my family down here. Diane, Matt, my son, Allie, Olive, and Alexa. I want to thank them for joining us this morning, giving me support. Today we're talking about the last of the sermon series, Jesus Code, Cracking the Secret Messages Contained in the Parables. We've been searching for the, par- the, the, for, for the mystery of the parables that Jesus taught his disciples according to the Gospel of Mark 4.10, verses 12. Jesus told his disciple, disciples that the secret of the kingdom of God has been given you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that They may be ever seeing, but never perceiving, and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Today's sermon's notes are included in the the bulletin again, so you can follow along with that. You can write notes, you can draw if you'd like to, whatever you'd like to do with those. In today's today's scripture, Luke begins by saying, now at the same time, there, there were some that were present that were reporting to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Their question was heartfelt. They wanted to know what he thought about a recent incident in the temple. A group of Galileans had been massacred by Herod's soldiers There he goes again, in the very act of them doing their sacrifices. Who knows, maybe they even burned them along with the sacrifices that they gave to God. The slaughter took place in the temple grounds, so it's just imaginable that something like that would happen. It's an atrocity. It's hard to imagine this heinous heinous act. Now, being from Galilee... It's possible that those who were asking the question may have even known some in the crowd that had been murdered. But instead of showing their outrage or pity, Jesus threw back the question at them. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than the other Galileans because they suffered such things? 
I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all perish in the same way. Taken at face value, it's hard to explain what Jesus is cold. Was he cold? Was he callous? Uh, he was, was he indifferent to the atrocities of life? Perhaps there's a part of the story that we're just not getting. Perhaps Jesus was distraught over the news and overcome by emotion. And it was only after he regained his composure that he went on to ask, but unless you repent, you will all perish in the same way. Jesus was teaching the crowd about priorities. It's foolish to strive after worldly wealth and, and a comfortable life and they don't pay enough attention to the relationship with God. He was emphasizing urgency, that they should repent now to seek salvation, for the kingdom of God is at hand. We never know when the door is going to knock, and we hope we can enter. Repent. We know that repent is to change. When I was a Sunday school teacher in Salem, Oregon, that was something that we kind of addressed with our class. We taught them about repent. We gave them a little stop sign. And, we, and as they marched in the class, we said, stop. And they said, repent. And then they turned around and walked the other way. That was what we taught them to do. And that's what it is to repent. We have to admit that we are going the wrong way. We are agreeing to change. It's one of the hardest things that we can do. Not surprisingly, when it comes to change, we do our best to avoid it in any way we can. Is it possible that in an effort to avoid change, we take an active approach to manipulate situations to our advantage? Perhaps we do every good work imaginable, but in the process we go unscathed. We go to church, we read the Bible, we serve on committees, we participate in community events, we even pray and we read devotionals. We do all these things, but at the end of the day, we're just as set in our ways as ever. Some say, we've always done it that way. Ever hear that? We've always done it that way. It's as if we're immune to change, or as if we're more like, maybe we're just afraid. My wife, Diane, went to church in Salem with me, naturally, and she used to sit in a certain place in the church. And she decided that she wanted to see the service in a different vantage point. And so she went to a different pew. I don't remember, could have even been on the opposite side of the church. And she sat down. In a little while, a lady came up to her and tapped her on her shoulder and said, Dear, you're sitting in my seat. <laughs> Diane looked up, surprised, I'm sure. And what did Diane do? She, she asked her, this is your seat? And the lady said, dear, I've been sitting here for 25 years every Sunday. Diane wasn't afraid of change. <laughs> so Diane moved immediately. In the same way, when you work, you have to face change. I'm a guy from the 80s where when, we, when I first started in retail, we, had, we just did paperwork. We didn't have computers in front of us. We had to rely on yesterday's business, not on today's. And some of you might remember in this very town, that there, this, this city, that uh, we had the popular, Mervyn's, J.C. Penney's, Montgomery Ward, Joskies, and of course Dillard's. 
Well, I came to work for Joskies as an assistant store manager, but later, about two years later, Dillard's acquired Joskies, as many of the stores did during those times. That's why you don't see the Mervins and J.C. Penney's and so on. One giant ended up taking over the, the other giant that was starting to fail a bit. So as I started there, I had to be the supervisor that trained other people to do their job. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know computers. But I sat not that well. So I sat and looked at it and realized I was now going to be doing my schedules. I was going to be looking at my business. I was going to be doing all the analyzing online. And so I had to, I mean, there's no way I could have continued to do what I was doing unless I accepted change. I had to get on the phone to the support department and have them walk me through step by step all the different functions that the computer did. I expanded my knowledge and became a successful leader with Dillard's because change became my friend. I knew that this was the only way of the future and I needed to change as, the oppor as an opportunity to set new traditions. Lots of times change happens that way it starts as something, a great idea, which, for example, in this church, started as a great idea over at Zumwalt Hall. And now look at us. It's expanded. It's a huge tradition, and we've even gone through several remodels. And that's what happens with traditions. Paul told the Corinthians, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. He went on to say, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not reconciling to them their trespasses, and having committed to us the word of reconciliation. We therefore, ambassadors on behalf of Christ, as though God were entreating us. Ambassadors for Christ. That's what we are. Pastor Eddie has been facilitating vision team meetings. Um, we've been working hard to look at the future of the church, five years out, 10 years out, and so on. And there's a lot of ideas that have come forward that have been great ideas. And I look forward to working with this church for a long time in creating those and making sure that those happen. The vision we're discussing is for St. Mark's to be a church of truth that leads change. A welcoming church where we can enjoy each other's company and work together to serve a common good. A church that must never lose sight of the fact that we are all called to honor Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and to live in such a way as to lead others to a personal relationship with him. What we need to be about, this, about in this church is truth that leads change and not simply truth for truth's sake. Think about it. We sing God's praises on Sunday morning and continue to hum them or even sing them throughout the rest of the week. We study God's word is so that it might be a living word for us the rest of the week. We reach out to others in the name of Jesus Christ so that they too might come to know him as Lord and Savior. Unless we're about truth, that leads to change, we're just going in circles. We're like the fig tree in the little parable Jesus told his followers. Now Jesus used the fig tree as a metaphor. Many people enjoy eating figs, and in Jesus' time, figs were a staple food. We have a small little fig tree in our yard that 
my granddaughter Alexa and her grandmother enjoy working with and picking. Alexa always comes over and says, I've, I, there's a fig on the tree. And she'll ask to pick it and she'll typically, like grandparents, we always say yes, and, unless it's not ripe. <laughs> and that's something they enjoy. I don't particularly care for figs. I don't know why I was picked to do this sermon on this, but there you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're just as good, fresh, as they are dried, I hear. I know they're in Fig Newtons, and those aren't too bad. He points out that the fig tree branches become stronger, and, and, and its leaves drop. It signals the fall is near. As the fig tree when certain signs appear, Jesus' followers will know that he is coming. Jesus was emphasizing the importance of being aware of signs of the times and being prepared for his return. No one knows when that's going to happen. The fig tree symbolizes prosperity and peace. It was a common plant in Israel often symbolizing the nation itself. For the nation of Israel, a fruitful fig tree represented the health and faithfulness of Israel, while a barren fig tree symbolized judgment. To break down what's happening here, we go back to the parable and recognize the design of the owner, the disappointment of the owner, the delayed asking of the owner and the destruction of the order by the owner when, the, when, the, when ordered excuse me, to cut the fig tree down. You can find these notes on the inside of your bulletin. The owner was frustrated that for three years he had been expecting to find fruit on his tree and he finally had enough. He tells the vineyard keeper, cut it down. The vineyard keeper loved his tree like he loves his entire vineyard and implores the owner to let it alone. He will give it extra care by nurturing it, by cultivating the soil, by really making it healthy. We all do that. Instead of ripping it out of the ground, maybe it needs more food. Maybe it needs more TLC tender, loving care. He says, let's give it one more chance. When the owner is heading to his vineyard, he didn't expect to see anything any different than he had for the past three years. When he saw his fruitless tree, he felt it was just occupying space. To break down what we're talking about here, he is really upset that this fig tree is not doing well. The possibility brought by this text is that the church and even our nation could fail the design of God and thus become the subject of judgment. It's up to the church to make sure we respond to God's call to make the church fruitful. Church track is a is a recording device that, uh, that uh, takes tabs on what's happening in churches and so forth. They reported a Gallup poll conducted March of this year that stated three in 10 Americans say they attend religious services every week. Is that sad? Anybody? Is that sad? Yes. yes. Actually, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us who know where people should be, who know that they can have such a wonderful life in coming to church to make a change in their lives. But it takes us telling them that. It takes us showing them that. Paul told the Romans, don't be conformed to this world, but be trans transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is good, well-pleasing, 
and perfect will of God. God calls us to embrace in our lives and proclaim to others the truth that leads to change. Think about it. There are many people out there who have not been spiritually nurtured or cultivated just to know Jesus Christ like we do. We all have friends, neighbors, coworkers, and even family members that we know need that nourishment. Our next sermon series will be part of the National Back to Church movement. The movement started 15 years ago as an invitation to call to action. On September 15th is National Back to School Day, celebrated right here at this church. It focuses on extending an invitation of love, peace, joy, and happiness that Jesus offers us to our friends, family, and neighbors. A single day to reclaim the true nature of the church, exactly as Christ has commanded us. Now more than ever, people need Jesus and a caring community where they can belong, grow, and flourish. The Jesus code is cracked. Just as humanity has created, was created to be fruitful and multiply, so is the church. The church gets a second chance to bear fruit in and out of season. For the church, there's only one season. It's always in season. So what do you hear the Spirit saying to you today? What changes do you need to make in order to stand blameless before the throne of God's grace? Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we are humble. We humble ourselves to you and seek to be your disciple. We pray for your forgiveness and ask you to receive us one more time. As your disciple and friend, we know that you are watching over us. Help us, Father, to watch over others. Help us to be caring in this world for others and go forward and bring change to our lives. We ask you, Father, to lead us to the truth that leads to righteousness. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, amen.